We live in a culture that is becoming increasingly divided. Every day we're being asked to make choices that push us to one extreme or the other. Some of these choices, they seem pretty harmless. But as we choose, we push harder and harder for what we believe is right. With all this division around us, it is more important than ever that the church be united in what we believe. Because a house divided will not stand. Well, good morning, church family. Our lovely Pastor Todd is out on a great vacation. So normally you get Cody, but today you get the ninth grade team. You don't even get JV. <laughs> Uh, my name is Jeff, and I am so glad to be here with you today. Um, what a great time of worship already to get us ready to hear from God. And today, I wanted to acknowledge first that we've been in a heavy few months kind of in our community here at the church. There's been lots of families in turmoil, lots of families dealing with the loss of loved ones. It's kind of just been heavy lately. And we may have heavy lives, but our God is greater than that. I have the privilege this morning, I'm going to get emotional, so get ready. I have the privilege this morning of not only sharing with you God's word, but also some incredible personal news that some of you have been a part of for a while. My wife, Sarah, and I, along with our two kiddos, Colin and Carly, have been a foster family for about four years. And we've had five different kiddos in our home. And four of those kiddos, we, we, we loved, we loved them all. But we hoped our foster care journey would end with the adoption of one of these children. And for four of them, it just it hasn't worked out. And the little girl that we have now, she's been in our home for over a year. And Sarah and I felt led to legally intervene in her case, to keep her in our home, but also to be able to adopt her. And this is, this is a, a, it was a big deal. And we came to you with a broken heart, uh, just asking for prayer. Sarah actually posted in a private Facebook prayer group. She said, hey, this is gonna be kind of expensive. If some of y'all have some stuff you wanna sell, like we'll do a garage sale. Like we're, we're just, we're trying to, trying to do everything we can here. And so we tried to be discreet. We tried to be quiet about it. Um, and that, that started an unleashing of God's people and God's love on my family. Um, the last kind of four weeks has been incredible, and it's been insane. Um, you, our church family, poured out your hearts, you poured out your prayers, and you even pulled out your wallets for us. You did fundraisers, you came to our front door and surprised prayer mobs. You asked us one-on-one -on -one how we were doing. It was just great. And it was a great reminder of what the church coming together in love looks like. We are overwhelmed. And you did what only you could do for us. And then God did what only God could do for us. After some time in court, after a lot of time in prayer, we received word Monday that we're going to be able to adopt our little girl in January. And, and the thing is, we, Sarah and I came with nothing except for a prayer, except for a hope, except for a need. And we give all glory to God and all thanks to God and to our amazing church family. I tell you this for a few reasons. First, to let you know that we love you guys, and that as a church, we should celebrate when God does something that only God can do. And so we have celebrated, and we are thankful. But I also want to highlight that Jeff and Sarah Stapleton, we get no glory from this. We get no credit, because God did what only God can do. And that's how the church should be. That's how our lives should be. We should be able to put aside 
ourselves for God's glory. And this time, we happen to be recipients of some of that great side effect, some of that great benefit of God's glory. That's how our lives should be, and that's how the church should work. And I could have used this reminder maybe a little bit earlier in life. When I was a kid, my family would go to Boo at the Zoo at the Fort Worth Zoo. Have any of y'all ever been? Um, It's basically the zoo open a few nights before Halloween, and they have carnival games, they have candy, and they have some shows. My favorite show was this guy, my voice cracked, a guy, puppet, something called Pirate Pete, okay? Pirate Pete, he had stinky feet, And then he did the boom, chicka, boom, boom, chicka, boom, boom, chicka, boom. That was his song. It was awesome. And my family just thought it was hilarious. And then in between acts, in between songs, Pirate Pete, the little puppeteer guy behind, would heckle the people walking by. It was so awesome. It was so funny to me. I I think that's where I developed my sense of humor and my willingness to be fully committed to a joke that I know would fail, but (laughs) tackling it with all my heart. I think that's where that started developing me. But... When I was in sixth grade, there was this new act. There was this guy with a table, and he was doing street magic tricks. He was doing coin tricks, card tricks, and my mind was blown. I had never seen this in person. I'd seen magicians on TV before, but I had never seen somebody up close where I'm watching their hands, and I see what happened, but I don't know how it happened. My mind was blown. I was wowed beyond belief, and so I decided I'm going to be a magician. I'm going to learn some magic tricks. And so I did. I I learned a few little tricks, coin tricks, card tricks. I had one of those boxes that, you know, have a lot of beginner magic sets. I even went to a a store in Arlington. That's where I grew up. um, And I bought a few tricks. And, And I did those tricks, and it was awesome. But the thing about magic tricks is once you do it once, it's kind of hard to do it again. Some tricks require a reset of some sort. There's like a little trick, you know, physical trick to them. Um, But even if they don't, each time you perform a trick for a group of people, the wow factor goes down. So you can only do a trick so many times. And I've got this problem. And some of you will understand. Some of you can relate. Some of you have been recipients of this problem. I have ADD. Not like the hyper kind, I'm a really chilled person, but the kind where we're talking and you're talking and I'm, I'm there and then I just stop listening and I don't mean to. And if I've done that to you, I'm very, very sorry. I just get super distracted. And that attention thing, let it, uh, it made it hard to learn new tricks. Tricks that took more than like three steps, I was out. I had stacks of magic books, but I didn't have the patience to sit there and go through and learn all the steps. And so... I had to give up my pursuit. I mean, I was right on the edge of making it, right? I had to give up my pursuit of being a magician because I couldn't wow the crowds anymore. I lost the ability to wow the crowd. And you may not be wanting to wow the crowd with magic tricks, but the reality is we all want to wow the crowd every day. We want to wow the crowd with our life. Again, it may not be a silly magic trick. It might be your job performance, It might be your looks. It might be the way you present yourself on social media. We all want to be relevant. We all want to be looked at as important. And that's not a bad thing unless it's the most important thing to us. When we make wowing the crowd our primary goal, we make our image the goal and we make ourselves an idol. And when we do that in relation to others, it's selfish. But when we do that to God... It's a much, much bigger deal. The stakes are much higher. If your goal is to wow the crowd, you're going to forever be in pursuit of that goal. You'll never make it. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We've been in this series, A House Divided. We've been talking about how God's values and the world's values are different, and there's division in the church sometimes. It's been a great series. It's taken us a while to get to chapter two, but here we are today in chapter two. And how fitting is it? Last week, Pastor Todd talked about God using the weak to humble the wise and to make his name known. I got to share with you today a little girl who had no home, basically. God using her for his glory. That is so awesome. Last week, we talked about God choosing the weak. Three times in the scripture last week, 
it was said that God chose the weak. He didn't get the leftovers. He didn't get the ones that nobody wanted. He got his first pick. And God chose the ones that the world looked at as weak. He got first dibs. He got the number one pick in the draft. He got the whole first round. It was great. Um, And why did he do this? To shame the wise and the strong and to make his name great. And so last week, we kind of talked about it like out here. God chose these people. This week, we pick up in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where Paul says, let me show you my own life as an example of this. And so if you got your Bibles open, we're going to start in verse 1. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. When I was looking over this mes- message the last couple of weeks, I kind of I was in, I was in this dilemma because. If you don't know, I'm the media and communications pastor here at Tabernacle. My job is to sit on the computer, make videos, make graphics, make things that look cool and kind of make people go, whoa, that's cool. And so immediately I read this verse and I was like, okay, what, what do I do? I'm going to try to preach a message where people go, good job, Jeff, because you want to do a good job. But then Paul's sitting here saying, I didn't wow the crowd. I only came to him with Christ crucified. And so my, my thought went from, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wow the crowd with my words to, I'm going to wow the crowd because it's going to be a five-minute message. We're going to beat the Methodists to lunch. You know, either way, it's memorable, right? Either way, it's a win. Um, But if you look at the passage, really, it's much, much deeper than that. And I got a new appreciation for this passage. Um, So I'm going to read verses one and two again. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with human eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Immediately, Paul is drawing a dividing line between the way he does it, the way God does it, and the way the world does it. See, in the ancient world, when a speaker would come to a new city for the first time, it was a big deal. You know, this was a world before social media, before newspapers, you know, before TV, a a speaker would just kind of stroll into a city, and he had one chance to make an impression on everybody. Speakers were kind of the entertainment of the day. They they called them, today we call them sophists. That's where we get the word for wisdom. They were wise people. They would come with a nugget of truth, and then surround it with this big flashy show. And it was, it was entertainment. They would, they would talk at parties, at banquets, at public gatherings. And if you were really lucky, you got to see two guys debate one another. And the thing with the sophist is they used big, impressive shows. It wasn't usually about even who was more right or who had the most truth. It was about who could wow the crowd the most. That was their goal. And as, as a hub of the Mediterranean world, Corinth was a gold mine for these types of people. The people of Corinth were wealthy. They were ready to embrace new ideas. They were uh, strategically located where everything in the ancient world came through them, ideas included. And so this was a great place. And Paul could have taken such big advantage of this. We read in Acts and in other places that Paul was an expert on the law, He knew his stuff. He was a Jew amongst Jews. He was really smart. Um, If you're not sure about that, just look at any, a lot of the New Testament that Paul wrote. His logic, his ways of building arguments is just mind-blowing. This dude was brilliant. And he could have come into that scene among those other wise guys, and he could have wowed the crowd with everything that he had. And it would have been awesome. I know, well, I assume, because Paul just, he he had to have. He would have been awesome. Um, But he didn't. He didn't do that. He says, I came to you nobodies as a nobody myself. I didn't try to impress you into faith. I didn't try to argue you into obedience in Christ. Paul made an intentional choice to only talk about God's story. The message and presentation were far different 
than what anybody else was doing and what anybody expected. And the message, wherever he preached it, wasn't for his own applause. It was for God's glory to be revealed. He was telling God's story, the story that Jesus' death on the cross was the saving event for the entire world. And this story of Jesus on its own was still raw. They didn't have the song, uh, the, the wondrous cross, all clinging to the old rugged cross. They didn't have that tradition of centuries of faith woven in the foundation of their culture. They had the story of a guy who said some weird things to them. Remember, this was only a few, few years after Jesus' death, 20 years maybe. They had the story of this guy who said that he knew the answer to everything, but he died. Paul used some strange words to proclaim him. And then he said, if you believe in this guy who died, that is the secret to everything. That's kind of a difficult message in the middle of all these wise, eloquent speakers. But that's the choice that Paul made. He vowed to make that the primary part of his message. He was willing to put aside everything. He was willing to put aside his knowledge, his reputation for God's glory. He kind of makes that the theme of his life. We read in Philippians 3.8, he says, I count all things to be in loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them all as rubbish so that I may gain Christ. And in verse three, he continues. He says, I came to you in weakness. Good start. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. In the middle of a world that was bent on wowing the crowd, Paul not only says he had a weak message, he he admits that he's weak himself. You know, coming into a new place, like I said, you had one shot at getting credibility from the people. Nobody knew who you were. But Paul chose to go about it this way. Admitting his weakness in front of people would have lowered his credibility. It would have lowered his esteem among the people. It could have even discredited him. Now, kind of, when I've been thinking about Paul in the past, I thought like he was this dude. He was arrogant, maybe arrogant, like, yeah, I know my stuff. I was the Jew among Jews. I was the expert on the law. And I really thought reading this, Paul was like humble bragging. He's like, yeah, you know, I'm I'm not that good, but I'm good. You know, I thought that's what he was doing. But he wasn't. He was being honest. He was being real. He knew firsthand the dangers and difficulties that came with proclaiming the gospel in that world. And he was not excited about it, but he was willing to endure the consequences for God's glory. He did it over and over again. I would be fearful if I were him. And he even admits, uh, we have a few writings that talk about Paul, not only his message, but his person. In 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, uh, he's responding to people who are like, that Paul guy's terrible. He, he says, um, for some say Paul's letters are demanding and forceful. We get that. But in person, he's weak and his messages and speeches are worthless. Okay, so in person, he may not have been super impressive. There's also a second century historical text that talks about Paul as not a, not a tall man with a bald head and a good-sized body. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he wasn't that bad. Uh, but it goes to say, it goes to say he, he was bow-legged. He was probably much, much shorter. He, he had eyebrows that met in the middle, and he had a somewhat hooked nose. So in the middle of this world, again, that's waiting for somebody, looking up to somebody who would wow the crowd, Paul's message and his appearance were not that. And he had, an, he had a purposefully kind of different message. Why would he do this? Why would he put all this aside? Why would he make a choice to do something he could have excelled at? Why would he make a choice to put that aside? Well, in verses four and five, it says, let's look. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. 
When Paul appears less, it only serves to magnify God's power, especially when it comes out of such an unlikely vessel. He's not excited about his weakness or poor health or unfortunate appearance or whatever else is going on with him. They were evidence that the message that Paul spoke was from God with the power of God, and that message changed people's lives in Corinth as it can change our lives today. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be wrapped in eloquence. It's the message of the cross in Jesus. You know, like I said, it's, it's not, Paul wasn't humble bragging again. He was saying things that ring loud and true today. He basically said, you've been astonished by the empty actions of others. You've been fed fluff and falsehoods and you can't get enough of it because there is nothing of substance there, but you eat it up. You know, I think of Russell Crowe, are you not entertained? You know, in the gladiator. uh, No, he says, I've got nothing for you except the power of Jesus through the message of the cross. And that message may not dazzle and wow people, but it leaves people satisfied and changed every time it's spoken with the power of God. We need to remember that. How many of you have ever been to a Disney theme park? I haven't, so I can't raise my hand. But some of you have. Imagine that you were able to slap a device on your wrist while you were at Disney, not the Fast Pass, for those of you who've been there, but a device that could monitor your happiness level. And every minute of the day, it made a a happiness mark, and then it printed out in this report that you could go back and look at at the end of the day. I imagine if you had a device at home like that on your wrist as well, your happiness level on the couch watching Netflix would be higher than your happiness level at Disney. Your couch is not hot and humid. Your your house is not too crowded most of the time. Your house does not have kids acting like maniacs most of the time. You're not yelling, well, maybe my house, but most houses, I'm sure you're not yelling. There's a lot to be said for a couch. I think I'm going to change my vacation plans. I don't know. But the memory of that trip to Disney is one of the highlights of your year. Why? Why does that happen? Are we crazy to think that? Maybe, but, but maybe not. You know, scientists and psychologists have studied how we remember experiences. We typically remember the beginning of something, whatever it is, and the end of something. So the beginning of a semester and the end of a semester at college. The beginning of a sermon and the end of a sermon. The beginning of whatever and the end of something. And then in between, you remember the peaks, the highlight moments, the good times in, in that event, in that thing. Um, so I, they, they, they call this duration neglect. Over time, your kind of overall perception of everything else fades away. And you're left with the beginning, the end, and highlights in the middle. So that's why Disney wows you when you walk in the front doors of, I've never been to Disney, they probably don't have doors, but you walk in, you're like, wow. Um, You remember your daughter loving and hugging on princesses. You remember uh, the big fireworks show at the end and you leave that, despite having a low happiness index, you leave that vacation going, wow, that was the highlight of my summer. That was the highlight of my year. Disney tricks you into remembering that you had a good time. They know how to make you wowed. They know how to make your brain go, that was incredible, even if it maybe wasn't. Paul recognizes that you can't trick somebody into following Jesus. I heard it said this week, what you lead somebody to Jesus with is what you keep them with. Do you want them to follow you or do you want them to follow Jesus? So you might be sitting here this morning going, okay, Jeff, I got it. That's a good little stroll through the passage, but I'm not Paul. I'm not in the first century. I'm not a preacher standing on a stage on a Sunday. So how does this message apply to me? Well, I believe there's some things that we can pull out of this that can apply to every single one of us, no matter what stage of life we're in. And the first one is to make Jesus central to your life. As I reflected on my life this week and a little bit before while I was preparing for this message, I was honestly a little disappointed in myself because I may not be a child trying to impress people with magic tricks, but I can certainly be childish in my goals sometimes. I've spent 
too many years of my life doing things, doing good things, even doing ministry things, so that people will go, wow, look at Jeff. He's a great student, or he's a great student pastor, or he's great at making pictures on the computer. You know, whatever it is, I've spent too many, of my, too many years of my life chasing that instead of making that a vessel only to reach others for Jesus. And there's been times in my life where sadly I've eaten it up. I've gone, yes, yes, I've arrived. I have made it. I am good and I deserve it. Yes, keep applauding, you know. And that can't be. When, when I say that, it's because I haven't made Jesus central to my life. And it's an easy mindset to slip into. The world has a set of values that contradicts God's values. The world wants you to wow everyone. They want you to put yourself out there. They want you to be the best you you can be. But God wants you to, sure, he wants you to be good, but he wants you to do it not for yourself, but for him. In Colossians 3.23, it says, whatever you do, do your work heartily. It's for the Lord rather than men. Those who aren't in Christ, they don't understand the difference. And sometimes those of us who are in Christ, we forget to when the world's values and God's values collide in our hearts and our minds, we have to choose God's or else we make an idol of ourselves. Maybe it's, maybe it's being obsessed with your image, um, never posting a picture on Facebook unless you photoshopped it first. Maybe it's constantly broadcasting your successes. Look what I did. Look what I did. Look who I am. Look what I got to do. Look who I met. Maybe it's doing things you normally wouldn't, making a compromise just to be cool. I was a youth pastor. Youth pastors are the worst at this because they're typically quite a bit older than the teenagers. Teenagers establish the cool factor, okay? Maybe, maybe not. I'm sure I'm not the cool factor today. Um, and so I've seen youth pastors fit into skinny jeans and, and be awkward and do things that they would never do just to look cool. I mean, when, you, when you're a youth pastor like I was, in my size, every, every jeans are skinny jeans, but that's beside the point. Um, but I've also seen it happen on the other side. You know, not chasing success, but broadcasting your, your failures or broadcasting disasters in your life for attention. Maybe it's, you've, you've made a struggle your identity. When somebody asks you who you are, you don't say, I'm a child of Christ. You say, I'm someone who's dealing with this. Maybe it's that you have a legitimate need, but all you do is say, I need, I need, I need, I need. Whatever it is, you might wear it like a badge. Either way, you're taking attention off of God and on to yourself, robbing him of any glory that he should be getting. If you're a believer, you need to realize that you cannot be the object of other people's attention or affection. If you're living life in this way, you need to consider yourself and God and realize that God is so much greater. God is so much bigger. We can't be putting ourselves up on a pedestal. We need to examine our hearts because only God should be the object of anybody's affection. The next thing you need to do is share your faith regularly. Now, I know this one's tough. Some people are like, yes, share your faith. And most people are like, whoa. Yeah, share your faith, because it's tough. It's not as exciting. It's, it's nerve-wracking. There was a recent study by the group Barna that concluded that, on average, Americans in general, only 8% of them have any faith-based conversation within a week. And only 23% of Americans, so less than one in four, will have any faith-based conversation once a month. And again, you may not be standing on a stage on a Sunday morning, but you are somewhere the rest of the week. You're around people that you know. God has put you in the places that you are for a reason. Now, unfortunately, the number one reason in this study that people gave for not sharing their faith is that they're afraid to offend people. And, and I get that, you know. The... The gospel, it is offensive. You're talking about an exclusive way to heaven, an exclusive way to follow God. No other way besides this. That offends people. 
You're talking about following a guy who died a gruesome and terrible death. That offends some people. And then you're talking about putting aside everything that the world says is most important for God who's most important. And even though somebody may not have a gut terrible reaction to that, that, that offends the most people. Compounding the problem is that Christians haven't always yielded this message with grace. And unfortunately, a lot of the world knows Christians for what we're against rather than what we're for. But God's put you in a place. It may be the place you work. It may be out on the baseball field. It may be in the bleachers. It may be doing disaster recovery. Um, It may be eating lunch with your buddies. God has placed you somewhere for a reason. And if you don't know where to start sharing your faith, we have a thing, we have programs like Can We Talk? Can We Talk is a program where you learn about sharing your faith, you practice with somebody else sharing your faith like in the group, and then we go out and share our faith in the community. It's a great way to get some experience sharing your faith. It's a great way to get some training. And it's even a great way to have some people come to Christ. But on its own, that is not the way that we're going to transform in us. Randomly knocking on doors is not going to do it. It has to be on your turf with your friends, with your family members. We're going to do this Can We Talk in, in the near future. I don't know exactly when, but if you're interested, be, be, you know, have your radar up for news on Can We Talk. Um, I want to take another burden off your back. If you don't want to do Can We Talk, or even if you do, I want you to realize that we can't do the wowing when we're talking to other people about Jesus. We have to let God create the wow factor. If you're trying to wow the crowd when sharing your faith, then people who have faith will have you as its foundation. There's lots of really, really popular pastors who people flock to and get saved, and that pastor leaves the church, and those people disappear. They may leave the church. They may leave their faith altogether because they haven't put their foundation in the right thing. They've put it in a man and man's wisdom instead of on Jesus. Our wowing the crowd is not winning people to Jesus. Our wowing the crowd is wooing people to us. It's the same game that Satan plays. So remember, God wants to use you no matter where he's put you. He's put you there for a reason. It may very well be because you're not a PhD. You're not a Bible scholar. You're not a Sunday school teacher. You're a dude with friends who need to hear about Jesus. And he has put you there for a reason. You were his first choice for that, not somebody else, not a church staff member, not a televangelist. You were the first choice. The power of the preached word does not depend on superficial packaging, but solely on the power of God to make it fruitful. There's this well-known youth pastor. I used to follow youth pastors a lot more than I do now. Uh, His name is Doug Fields. And when talking about evangelism to students, he says, the good news is God is not waiting for the perfect talk to do a mighty work through you. I'm gonna say that again. God, the good news is God is not waiting for the perfect talk to do a mighty work through you. He goes on to say to youth pastors um, that they often feel the need to try to make the Bible relevant for teenagers. We don't need that because it already is relevant. Everything that teenagers are looking for, Jesus already is. And although that quote is for youth pastors to teenagers, that applies to every single one of us. You don't have to create the wow factor when talking about God. That's by design. That's the good news. So again, we're in this series called A House Divided. Division doesn't start, though, in the house. It doesn't just drop out of nowhere. Division starts in the hearts and minds of its people. Imagine what would happen in your own heart if you took these things seriously if you made Jesus the center of your life, if you talked about your faith regularly, and then whether you're talking about your faith or just being an obedient believer, you let God create the wow factor. Imagine in your own life how you would change. And I love this church. And this is, I hear horror stories about churches that fight, that things go wrong. And so this isn't a wag in my finger. I don't believe we have a house divided here. I believe we have a house unified. And I got to see that on display in my own life, in my family's life, the last four weeks. But imagine if we tackled everything that way as a church. Not just a little girl who 
who we hope to adopt. But if we tackled everything as a church family, how that could change. And so, corporately or individually, it could be life changing, but corporately, it could be church changing and revival bringing. And so, I just want to ask you today where are you in, in this passage? Maybe it's you need to work on your priorities and putting Jesus first. Maybe, maybe there's somebody that you know God's put in your life that you need to share your faith with, but you haven't. Or maybe you've made it all about you, and when you share, you're trying to say, Jesus, plus this, plus this, plus this, plus this, plus this, equals faith. And in reality, that confuses us and scares us, so we don't say anything. But we really need to remember, it's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. And it's also your own story. You can share your own story along with God's story. When you think about sharing your faith that way, it's like, oh, I can do this. I can talk about how God changed my life. I can talk about how as an eight-year-old boy, my cousin got baptized, and I went, huh, what's he doing up there? And that caused me to ask questions about God and about following Jesus. And yes, I wanted to be baptized like my older cousin who was cool, but through that process, I learned that I had to give my life to God. That's, a great, that's half your story right there. That's half of you're telling people about Jesus. And you may have a story just simple like that. You may have a crazy story that takes longer to tell. But it's not as difficult as we make it out to be. Then we tell the story about Jesus, who was the perfect man, who died as a spotless sacrifice. He had never done anything bad in his life that would warrant a separation from God. And he was the only one that had the ability to die for somebody else's sins. And in love, he died for all of our sins to take the penalty that we deserve for our sins so that if we would say, Jesus, you're the most important thing to me, I'm gonna follow you. Jesus said, you're in my family now. Not just you get to go to heaven, but you're a new person now. And that's it, that's the story. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be Jesus plus and Jesus plus and Jesus plus. It's simple. So maybe, maybe you've got one of those things you need to think about today. Um, we're gonna close in a word of prayer. We're gonna have some prayer partners down here. I'll be here. If you need to pray, if you need to make a decision, you can do it where you are. You can talk to another Christian who you're friends with, or you can come talk to one of us down in the front. Let's pray together. Father God, I am thankful for this church family. And I am thankful that you reminded me that I need to put everything on you. I need to put my effort into making you known, not making Jeff known. And God, I ask for forgiveness where I haven't done that, where I've, I've tried to make myself the central part of the story. And I ask that in the hearts and minds and lives of our people in our church that you use this time and the future to continue to solidify this church, bring unity, and, and, uh, and continue doing incredible things for your glory, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen.